honestly, for the most part, I'm not drawn to books about leadership. Um, I will often find if I'm talking with somebody, if they're involved in academics, uh, a theologian or a philosopher or a psychologist, I will be very energized in that conversation. Um, if somebody is involved in leadership, I value leadership a lot, but I don't have the same kind of resonance with it. I don't find myself drawn to those kind of books or talks as much. But it was a long journey for me to come to grips with that. And it was very, very painful. And for a long time, I just uh, needed to think of myself as an effective, confident leader. Because the only alternative category to that for me was loser. Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I'm so glad you joined us today. If you're new, make sure you subscribe. And if you enjoy the conversation, leave a comment as well. Well, I think you're going to enjoy it because John Ortberg is back on the podcast. And we're going to talk about the seeming divide between leaders who focus on leadership and people who focus on spiritual development. Why do the two camps never seem to meet? Could they meet? If you're a leader type, how do you become more spiritually formed? If you're a spiritually formation kind of person, how do you become more leadership focused? So John and I have a great conversation about that. Today's episode is brought to you by The Art of Preaching. So that's my course that will teach you how to deliver a talk without using notes, like just actually make eye contact with people and not worry about what you think you're going to say or what you're not going to say. So we'll teach you that, teach you how to take a really confusing topic and make it clear in a way that people will remember for years. And also, we'll also focus on how you can connect with truly unchurched people. So click the link below or just go to theartofpreaching.com and enroll today. And then it's also brought to you by Glue Marketplace. So Easter is coming up, right? You've got to focus on what matters most, your message. Well, did you know in the marketplace, you can find worship songs, kids' curriculum, and a whole lot more that's going to make your life so much easier, go to glue.us slash marketplace, or just click the link below. And now, my conversation with John Orberg. Oh, John, what a joy to have you back. Welcome. Thank you, Kerry. Um, it's always, I look forward to it. If I get the chance to talk with you, I know it's going to be really interesting, and there'll be questions um, that will be really provocative. So thanks for having me on. Well, I think since the last time we had you on, our friendship has only deepened, and I'm truly grateful for that. And we were thinking about things to talk about, and you had suggested the dichotomy or seeming dichotomy, apparent dichotomy, between leadership and spiritual formation. In other words, you know, to put it this way, there are leaders who love leadership, but would say, I'm not very good at spiritual formation. Um, let's start there, because I would say i probably guilty as charged, like, I read my Bible and pray every day, and I love this mm -hmm. stuff, but I don't ooze spiritual formation the way you or mm -hmm. John Mark Homer, who we just had on, or Dallas Willard or anything. So uh, what are your thoughts on, on an apparent dichotomy, or how does that emerge? Uh, what are you seeing, John? Yeah, um, it's an interesting question as to why it is, but I'll just start with um, that it is. Uh, you know, there's a huge... Uh, uh, it's sometimes called leadership industrial complex. And uh, the study of leadership, the asking how do we form leaders, how do we help people become better leaders, uh, that, that's a topic of huge interest. Barbara Kellerman's written a book called The End of Leadership. And uh, she cites, I think it was Forbes in 2018, said $87 billion were spent on leadership development. Training books says so. That's a huge topic. Uh, and then, of course, down through the ages, questions of how do people change? Um, what does formation look like? What does spiritual formation look like? Uh, the field of psychology in our day is deeply devoted to that question of um, how do we change? How are we able to become emotionally healthy? What kind of interventions are effective? How do we measure that? So that's been huge. I think in some ways, uh, particularly in the church, leadership culture, and for lack of better language, this is a horrible language, spiritual formation culture tend to be kind of two different subcultures. Yeah. And it's a bit like um, people who are wired to be activists will be drawn towards leadership. People who are wired to be contemplatives, where they're more reflective and want to engage in thinking about stuff, they'll be more drawn to 
writing and reflections about spiritual formation. I thought in some ways it's a little bit like when we were in school and there would be the nerds and the jocks. And mm -hmm. those tend to be kind of two different cultures. And then when we grow up, you have kind of business culture. Business culture, because it's very outcome oriented, tends to be a leadership intensive culture. And then academic culture or therapeutic culture, which is more oriented towards looking at the inner life and um, reflecting on it, tends to be a different kind of culture. So I think the, um, uh, leadership and spiritual formation um, tend to run on tracks involve issues, require a kind of wiring that tend to be different from each other. And it just seems to be the case that very often, as you look at the church, um, people who are really interested in leadership, that want to learn more about it, that want to achieve great results and be able to monitor it and uh, expand their leadership capacity, often are not deeply involved in the X's and O's of how does spiritual formation work. And very often people who are deeply involved in spiritual formation find themselves not very, not terribly interested in leadership. That is so well said. So to take it to the next level, because I think there's a lot we should explore even in that dichotomy. Let's go back to when you were starting out in ministry. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think we all know the answer to this question, but where did you find which subculture? I love the way you, you use that phrase. Which subculture were you naturally more attracted to, and do you know why? Well, uh, that's been a long, long journey for me. So this gets to real personal issues. Um, uh, when I was growing up, I think my wiring definitely would have been more on the contemplative side. I can remember when I was like in seventh grade, uh, or so, um, wanting to read in the summertime. And my mom saying, oh, you need to get out there. You need to be with other kids more and so on. And I, I think I was uh, discovering part of the way that my wiring was. At the same time, uh, I'm a three on the Enneagram. And for a whole variety of reasons, I had a very strong need to see myself as a leader. Mm. And so that word over the years became a very charged word for me. And um, to want to be and to want to be thought of as a leader was a deep, deep part of my identity. And so I think I would work hard to try to look like I thought a confident leader would look and try to win the titles that a leader might win. And uh, so that was a very, very long journey for me. And it, it, it took many, many years uh, to kind of try to come to grips with my own wiring. My own wiring is such that uh, we were talking about what books you're drawn to. Honestly, for the most part, I'm not drawn to books about leadership. Um, I will often find if I'm talking with somebody, if they're involved in academics, uh, a theologian or a philosopher or a psychologist, I will be very energized in that conversation. Um, if somebody is involved in leadership, I value leadership a lot, but I don't have the same kind of resonance with it. I don't find myself drawn to those kind of books or talks as much, but it was a long journey for me to come to grips with that. And it was very, very painful. And for a long time, I just uh, needed to think of myself as an effective, confident leader because the only alternative category to that for me was loser. Mm. And, um, uh, when I went, I was for about a decade at a church in Chicago, Willow Creek Community Church, mostly in the 90s, when that was like a graduate education of leadership. And there was a lot about mm -hmm. that that was wonderful. There were other ways in which it could be pretty toxic. Um, but over time, I had to come to grips with the fact that um, uh, I'm not a leader, at least in some of those senses of the word. And then to make it really interesting, I married to somebody who has very strong leadership gifts and who happens to be a woman. And so there's all kinds of gender issues there in terms of identity and masculinity that I had to wrestle with. And so it was very painful. I can remember uh, literally being in the basement of the house where we lived in Chicago and just sobbing 
and saying, all right, God, I will give up being a leader. And feeling like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what's left for me to be or do of any kind of significance at all. It was very, very painful for me to let go of that need, to let go of that part of my identity. Um, and to recognize that I'm married to somebody where that's uh, naturally a part of who she was. Um, now, after a couple of years of grieving over that, I came to a place of great freedom mm -hmm. and um, uh, I, I came to a place where uh, I delight in watching those kind of gifts in my wife. And they have nothing at all to do now with my own sense of who I am. And I think my understanding of leadership has broadened and become more layered, but it's now the source of a lot of freedom and joy. But for anybody who's watching this, um, there was a long journey for me. And um, I, one of the theories that I have is for most of us, there'll be areas where we're gifted. This is how who God made me to be. It's good to find that. There'll be other areas where I'm not gifted, where I'm weak. And mostly I don't care about that. I'm not good at carpentry. It doesn't bother me. But I think for most of us, there'll be one area where I'm not gifted, but I have an emotional need to think I'm gifted <laughs> and to identify that and be able to let go of it as soon as possible in life, in work, in ministry will be really helpful because there's so much freedom on the other side. But I have known people where they're not gifted in some area, but they have a need to think they are and they can never let go of it. And they're kind of miserable their whole life long. Do you know where that drive, desire to become a leader came from in your childhood or your formation? And if you do know, could you share with us to the extent you're comfortable sharing what was driving that idea that if you're not a leader, you're a loser? Because that's yeah. a really powerful framing, John. Yeah. Uh, mostly sin pathology and ego, I suppose. Okay. Um, what is sympathology? What is that? What is sympathology? I'm, I'm not familiar. Uh, actually, with that that's a great new word. Uh, I intended oh. to say sin, comma, pathology, comma, oh, ego. sin pathology. Got it. <laughs> but, but I like uh, sin pathology. That's interesting. I think, I think that could be a new carrying, carrying you off book <laughs> coming soon to bookstores near you. Um, uh, probably have a lot of material for it. Yeah. I, 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 I think it was a lot of junk, honestly. I think it was a lack of self-awareness. I think uh, I grew up in a family where um, my need to be and feel like I was regarded as special mm. and uh, to be an achiever and to get strokes for being an achiever um, was pretty high. Um, uh I was a sophomore in high school before I had a really good friend. And I wow. can remember in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, my sister and I were very close. So there's that relationship. My cousin Danny, uh, that, that was a close relationship, but they're relatives. So they kind of have to do that. But that sense of being included in, you know, sleeping over somebody's house, uh, having somebody who wants to be with you. Uh, that was absent until I was a uh, sophomore in high school. And then within a week, it happened very, very quickly with my friend Chuck. And all of a sudden, I had a best friend. It's like, oh, this is, that's what this is like. So it came as a great gift, and I've always valued friendship. But I think, I think also that sense of feeling in those real formative years of early adolescence, I feel like I'm on the outside. And... Uh, uh, I want to be able to achieve and I'm able to do this, you know, with whatever intelligence I have and I'm able to do this, whatever talents and giftedness that I have. So my job is to mobilize those things to look like a happy, successful, confident achiever. And all of that got wrapped up in the word uh, leader for me. And so uh, it, it felt like, um, that was my job. That was my identity. My personhood and worth were wrapped up in that. And uh, it would not have been possible for me emotionally to entertain the question, what if I am not strongly gifted in leadership? I would not have been able to uh, absorb that question. Do you think in your life or other people's lives, leadership sometimes can become a substitute for friendship or a means mm -hmm. to friendship? 
there's some parallels in your childhood mm. and mine that I'm picking up on. So it's a personal question. Yeah, definitely. I think I was probably yeah. trying to satisfy with the image of leadership a hunger that could really only be fed by genuine friendship. And uh, uh, I, I do think uh, leadership is a word that requires more nuanced thought. This, this would be a good place for some bullet points. Um, <laughs> Uh, 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 in that book that I mentioned, The End of Leadership, Barbara talks about, I think, 1,500 different definitions of leadership that are offered in the leadership industrial complex. Um, my favorite is from a Harvard guy, Ron Heifetz, who said that leadership is disappointing people at a rate they can stand. Oh, yeah. That is beautiful. And uh, you think about Jesus, it's like, that's not bad. But I think one of the challenges, you know, there'd be the question of, is everybody a leader? And one of the difficulties with that is, uh, I don't think it's possible to have a single definition of leadership for this reason. On the one hand, every human being was made in the image of God. And at the core of that is, we were given a will so that we're able to create and choose and we were made to exercise dominion. Mm. And exercising dominion, being strong and creative in the service of the good, that is an indispensable part of every human life. Uh, so you have the kind of imagery in the Bible um, all the way through to Revelation that the saints will sit on their throne. Well, what is that all about? What does it mean we're gonna sit on a throne? Well, we will be exercising dominion. I, I will have this little sphere where my will uh, is in charge, where I am able to choose and to create and to bring good. And uh, that's part of why most of Jesus' teachings about leadership is in the, in the, in the category of warnings, because it is so hard to lead people without violating their kingdom. And we were all made to have a kingdom. So in that sense, um, it's terribly important to understand everybody is a leader. Everybody ought to bring initiative. Everybody mm -hmm. ought to have agency and uh, uh, reign in their little kingdom. And then we also are leaders in the sense that we're not made to uh, just give into peer pressure and the knuckle right. under to what other people tell us to do or want us to do. Um, uh, we are made to uh, have um, strength of will. That's a real good thing. Um, then there's another category that might be called um, organizational leadership. And that would involve a more specific set of skills um, uh, to be able to cast a vision, to be able to inspire a group of people, let's go here, to be able to measure, um, are we achieving mission, to be more committed to the accomplishment of tasks than the preserving of peace. So that I think for people who have a strong gift of organizational leadership in that way, it will kind of grate on them if somebody is in the wrong role and they're not contributing well, and they won't particularly mind having to upset the relationship uh, in order to get the job done. It will be harder for them not to say something because they want to get the job done. And that's where I tend not to be wired up that, as much that way. I tend to want peace more. So I can have that conversation, but it's, it's harder for me to do that. Um, so, that that notion of organizational leadership, I think in Romans 12, when it talks about if you have the gift of leadership, then lead. It's a bit like the gift of evangelism or the gift of um, generosity. We're all made to evangelism. We're all made to be generous and to give. We're all made to lead, but some people have a particular skill set around there. And that's where that particular skill set is not the core that I bring. But that ability to distinguish between leadership as the dominion that's part of being made in the image of God, um, leadership as a person with a strong moral compass and a healthy will. Um, situational leadership is another one where uh, if you have medical expertise and somebody uh, faints, then you're going to lead in that moment. If you're uh, out on a hike and you know nature well and the group is lost, you, there's situational leadership. But then there is, there is a, I think, a set of skills around what might be called organizational leadership. 
And if that's not valued and prized and encouraged, then the church really suffers. And I think that has often happened. It's often happened in the mainline church. There's often traditions of churches where uh, uh, the craft of leadership in that sense is not prized and valued. And then the church is in trouble because um, that craft is also a God-given gift to the human race that needs to be celebrated. So long, long rambling answer, but uh, I, I think that that word leader is is begging to be unpacked in a way that both recognizes um, the unique dominion in everybody and recognizes the need for great leaderships, particularly within the church. So you would say that principally, if I'm hearing you right, it was organizational leadership that you're probably not most gifted at. Yes. Personal dominion, um, some situational leadership, uh, the ability to decide for yourself, personal leadership, right? Yep. That That is good, but it's organizational leadership. So I don't want to rush to Willow Creek because you had a rich ministry in life before Willow and a rich ministry in life after Willow. But if you want to look at the 90s and the 2000s, mm-hmm. who was at the apex of leadership was the folks at Willow Creek. Mm-hmm. And as you mentioned, a very mixed record uh, with some challenges there. But, you know, along the way, let's say culminating at Willow to that point in your life, what did you learn about the two tribes, about the spiritual formation mm-hmm. people, the leadership people? What did you learn about leadership in its healthiest expressions and perhaps its least healthiest expressions? What are some insights that you think would be helpful for leaders listening that you learned either at Willow or leading up to Willow? Yeah, I I think on the warning of leadership, because leadership is so closely related to the image of God and our desire to reign, um, it has great power when it's used well, but it can be uniquely destructive when it's not. And um, we're prone to idolize it, particularly in our culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I just jotted this down because it's in Barbara Kellerman's book. Um, at Harvard Law School, its mission statement, as you may know as a former lawyer, its mission statement is not to train lawyers. It's to devoted to training leaders in the legal profession. Hmm. In medical school, their mission statement is not we're here to train doctors. It's to train leaders in the medical profession. You can look this up. In Harvard Divinity School, I'm not making this up. It's not to train pastors. It's to train, what I guess, leaders. Leaders in, in the spirit of ministry. Faith. Yeah. Uh, and Yale University, not to be left out, has a leadership institute, a woman's leadership institute, a global health leadership initiative, chief executive leadership institute, an MBA in leadership of healthcare. You go through school after school after school after school. Uh, down to elementary schools, um, uh, everybody wants their kid to be a leader. And so we live in a world where we kind of idolize leadership. The irony is you would think we're spending $87 billion a year on it. So at least one good thing is we don't have to worry about having great leaders now. Uh, in politics, in business, in churches, $87 billion a year, Yale, Harvard. So we got great <laughs> leaders everywhere. Except of that's course, so funny. When that's you look so at uh, people's confidence in institutions, uh, back in the 1950s, when people were asked, "Can you trust the government to do the right thing?" About 70 percent of people said, "Yeah." And now, 60 or 70 years later, after untold billions of dollars spent investing in leadership development, it's down at about 15 uh, percent. And about 7% of employees would say that they could trust their employer. So somehow, somehow our ability to understand and develop good leaders is way lower than what we all think that it is. And um, uh, so I think um, uh, one of the things that I loved about Willow Creek was it was a place that at its best genuinely sought to... um, prize and reclaim the value of leadership for the church. And I think that's a desperately needed thing. Um, It's interesting. I forget where I wrote it, read this, but um, somebody, as they were looking at kind of evangelicalism uh, in the last hundred years or so was saying in the years after world war II, 
if you had organizational leadership gifts to a high level, and I'll, I'll, I'll just use that phrase for lack of a better one, but sure. Kerry, work on that. Come up with a better phrase. <laughs> you've got really strong uh, organizational leadership gifts, uh, love to achieve, love to mobilize people, love to achieve tasks, love to build team, love to develop people, love to hold people accountable, love to leverage resources as well, love to monitor how you're doing, uh, love to infuse fresh energy. If you love doing that kind of stuff, um, you probably would want to go into a parachurch organization, not into the local church, because the mm. local church was not really wired to be able to unleash a great leadership gift. And so in those early years, you would have um, World Vision and Campus Crusade and Focus on the Family and uh, InterVarsity and Young Life and um, all of these parachurch organizations because uh, people who had great wiring motors that ran at a really high level for organizational leadership. But generally, I was talking to somebody who's a really good leader. Like, what does a leader want? A, a really good leader wants um, velocity, freedom, opportunity to move quickly. And the church tended not to offer those things, but the parachurch mm -hmm. world did. And then part of what happened, uh, and uh, probably Willow Creek and Saddleback were two of the churches that that – uh, led the way in this was uh, you had local churches where people with quite extraordinary leadership gifts were able to unleash those in the service of the local church. Mm -hmm. And so you had levels of vision and energy and possibility and uh, the attraction of folks and a vision that could be spread to other people about what a local church might be and um, lids and ceilings and boundaries that had been present for a long time, all of a sudden felt like they were getting exploded. So I, I think part of what was going on there was uh, an attempt to recapture, uh, reclaim the power of redemptive leadership in the service of the local church that was and could be wonderful. And so, uh, when I was there to get to watch that. Because I, I do like to grow a lot. And one of the great things about being in a leadership position is it does force you to grow. So part of what I learned was um, uh, it wasn't a black or white situation there. There were aspects of organizational leadership uh, where I would feel quite clumsy and think I'm not very good at that. And then there were parts of it uh, I, I love strategic thinking. I love to think about vision. I love to dream about how to cast vision. I love being part of a team that's seeking to move in that direction. Um, I love that experience of growth that comes when you're sitting in that chair. And uh, so later on when I was at Menlo, there would be times when uh, I would actually try to give away the organizational leadership tasks so that I could focus more on communication. Uh, but we struggled with finding the right way of doing that. So I ended up doing more of the organizational leadership parts. Um, but at that point, it was really seeking to do it out of service and not out of need. So uh, I was okay with it. So it felt like I got to see both the upside of seeking to reclaim that and wanting churches to do that. And I love to blow that trumpet. I, I love for churches to... Um, seek to leverage and redeem and reclaim the gift of leadership. Um, but it was also a place where uh, if you ask people at Willow back in those days, what's your top spiritual gift? For everybody, it was leadership. Because it was this kind of a culture where, although we would say in the culture, all gifts equally matter to God, everybody knew in the hidden curriculum, in the... Uh, unspoken way that we all related with each other. If I don't have this gift, I'm really kind of a second-class citizen. And uh, so there was a way in which it tended to get kind of idolized. These are the people who really count. These are the people who really make it happen in a way that diminished the dominion, the imago uh, in lots and lots of people. Hmm. What what were you doing before you accepted the job at Willow, the position at Willow? 
Um, I was at a church previous to that. So my uh, I went, went on kind of a circuitous path. I went to Fuller Seminary after college uh, and thought I would go into psychology. I got a PhD in clinical psychology. Uh, I was always fascinated in those questions. But then when I began to do therapy, I didn't like it very much. And people got unhealthier the longer they saw me, which is not a good thing. And <laughs> I started preaching at a church at the same time I was getting a master of divinity simultaneously. And when I preached, I would find, man, I kind of come alive. And I got to work on a team at a church. My boss, John F. Anderson, is still a very dear friend, just a hilarious guy. I loved working with him. I love being a part of that team. So um, uh, the journey for me was a very experiential one. I never got the call. Um, I, I had to... Uh, work at discerning what the right way was to invest the work in my life, but came to the conclusion, given my own gifts and values. And so that becoming a pastor and serving the church was a good way to do it. So uh, I ended up being at a little church plant in Southern California. And um, that's where I was working. I had been there for about four years when uh, I got the call. It was about a one-year process uh, of initial nope, but then eventually going to Willow Creek. So when I went to Willow Creek, there were more people on staff at Willow Creek than there had been in the entire congregation that I was serving in Southern California. Why did you say yes to Willow? Uh, you know, initially the call came and I, I ended up saying no. And said, I, I, I want to stay at this church where I am for another year. And I think by the end of that time, I'll have a sense of should I remain here or not. And um, uh, so that's what I did. And at the end of that time, uh, I went back and spoke at Willow Creek at, uh, interestingly, the very first kind of embryonic conference for what would eventually be uh, the Leadership Summit. Uh, and talked about spiritual formation at that conference. So it's interesting giving, uh, given our topic today. And it was just one of the most um, remarkable and transcendent experiences in speaking that I have ever had. Hmm. Uh, uh, and, and you will know that sense when you're done with a talk of feeling like there was a power that was present here that I don't fully understand, but that I recognize. And um, uh, that experience more than anything else was what kind of tipped the scale. I was had been offered at that time also a job at Menlo, which is the church I went to 10 years later. Mm -hmm. Nancy had also been offered a job at Menlo. And Menlo is in California and Willow Creek is in Chicago. Nancy was not looking forward to going to Chicago. <laughs> um, uh, she was not offered a job at Chicago. I, I told Willow Creek if we went there, my wife feels a real strong call to ministry. So I, I would not be able to stay here if she continues to feel that call. And there wasn't a place there. And they said they would, uh, you know, make certain to find a place for her. But what happened, Carrie, was I found that uh, if I went to Menlo, I would wonder what would have happened if I had gone to Willow Creek in a way that wasn't true the other way around. If I went to Willow Creek, I wouldn't have that same wondering what would have happened if I would have gone to Menlo. It was such a unique opportunity to learn, to watch, to experience uh, in that season. And so Nancy and I made that choice very much together. But when I told her that thought, she both of us kind of recognized, yep, that name's something going on. Hmm. So, I mean, I remember when you went to Willow, that was 1990, what was it? John? Am I right? Yeah. 94. I remember. Yeah. And almost immediately, I thought of you as the spiritual formation guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were teaching, do you remember the Old Testament challenge? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That was packaged out. We actually did that at our church, which was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But you did, you offered that. You were kind of the spiritual voice. What did you, is that when things became clear for you about why do I want to be a leader? Um, what is this about spiritual formation? Like what, what insights do you have looking back on that season uh -huh. at Willow between 
um, the whole leadership impetus and the spiritual formation, which you seemed pretty comfortable with even back in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, I, I think as I look back on my life, you know, Parker Palmer, the Quaker educator, has a wonderful little book called Let Your Life Speak, which is a Quaker phrase. And the idea of it is, if you want to discern God's will for your life as you're moving forward, begin by looking backward. Mm -hmm. and look at what energized me, what moved me, what mattered to me, what seemed important to me. And um, from as early as I can remember, those kind, the kinds of questions that led me to uh, actually study psychology in grad school, how do people change? Why is change so hard? Where does God fit into that? How can I experience change? Um, all of the mystery and wonder and significance of what kind of person am I becoming? Those were the questions that really resonated, have always resonated most deeply with me. Uh, they have always seemed like those are the questions that matter the most and everything else is kind of, uh, yeah, I'm glad somebody's working on that stuff, but yeah. uh, it's just felt that way to me. And uh, uh, so then when I went to Fuller, the integration of psychology and theology, how do these things fit together, was terribly um, interesting. And really, it was reading Dallas Willard uh, initially, uh, his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, that was the most impactful book for me outside of the Bible itself. And so um, that was really where... Uh, the the understanding pursuit of spiritual formation became actionable and concrete in my own life um, uh, in a way that really, really mattered. And I realized there was wisdom around this. I, I grew up in a church. I'm really grateful for that. But kind of the only two arrows in my quiver of spiritual life were prayer and Bible study. Mm -hmm. And I was getting really frustrated because I felt like, well, I'm trying to do that. I'm supposed to have my quiet time. Somebody asked me, how's your spiritual life going? I would think, am I having a regular quiet time? And if I was, then it's going good. And if I'm not, then it's going badly. But that was pretty thin stuff to actually be changing. Like, how do I become more loving? And how do I become more joyful? And I realized I don't even know how to think about these things. And, and they were all quite divorced from all the stuff that I had studied in clinical psychology. And so it was really reading Dallas, who actually was a psychology minor when he was in college and read widely in psychology as well as philosophy, as well as theology, that all of that began to come together. And I realized there's enormous wisdom and great things to read about how do you pursue this? Um, so uh, those questions that had always been there for me um, found uh, fields in which to reap um, that uh, became very energizing. So then I think when I was at Willow Creek, I was both on the journey of um, needing to discover both gifts, interests, and limitations on the leadership side. And then having a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful platform to be able to think about spiritual formation and to teach about it with a congregation and then the other churches that were looking at Willow that were very interesting and very receptive. So I think it was a place where both the journeys on the leadership side and on the spiritual formation side, which were very personal, that involved a lot of energy and a lot of pain, were able to come together, sometimes collide in ways that ended up being really rich. I don't know that I've ever thought about it in quite that much detail until you asked the question. So thank you. No, I'm glad I asked the question. And, you know, it's one of those things because, as we hinted at earlier, Willow was synonymous with the apex of leadership for a couple mm -hmm. of decades. And then, obviously, you know, things were happening that were awful and we didn't know about. We just didn't know about. And, um, yeah, just just what a sad, sad, sad ending. When you see, because I think you can make the argument that leadership devoid of deep spiritual formation is yeah. not going to be sustainable leadership. Is that fair, John? Like as much um, as I might not be wired the way you are. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? I mean, in a church context, business context, sure. But yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it through. I think that, uh, uh, 
if there's an utter character breakdown, um, yeah. uh, no organization will be able to sustain that. So uh, at a bare minimum, if you have a leader and they are unable to restrain anger or, uh, you know, any number of impulse control issues or so on, then uh, eventually it will have a self-destructive um capacity to now obviously all of us are on a spectrum there someplace from you know walking impulse control disorder to uh, mother Teresa and uh, uh, I, I certainly think there are folks who are leaders that have very severe character problems and they get away with it till they die you know so I, I am not one who believes the truth will always come out you know the truth's going to come out with God one day. Um, but in this world, we live in a broken world and all kinds of injustice goes on and some of it goes on for a long time. I think it's important to recognize that so we don't get complacent about it and just say, well, you know, nobody who's a really bad person is going to be able to make it and sustain it so we can just trust truth's going to come out. I, I don't know that that's the case. I think we all have to work on that. Um, uh, uh, and And I'm not sure that bad character lasts longer in the corporate world than it does in the church world. Hmm. Um, I think people are people and ethics are ethics and mistreatment of people is mistreatment of people. And often those of us who are inside the church can write off people who are in the corporate world as secular. So you can do anything you want to. I think people who are abusive and angry and unjust, uh, that will tend to come out in the corporate world as well. In thinking about leadership mentors, um, uh, one of maybe the most impactful mentor for me on the leadership in particular side was a man named Max Dupree. Oh, yeah. And Max was for many years the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, uh, Herman Miller, and his books, Leadership is an Art and then Leadership Jazz, uh, are remarkably wise. Um, uh, Max would often talk about things like the sin of unrealized potential. And I would have to say, uh, although most of Max's writings about leadership are not overtly Christian, um, his approach to leadership, his understanding of leadership, his theory of leadership was actually way more profoundly Christian than the theory, the leadership strategies of many pastors at huge mega churches are. So uh, mm. I do think it's it's worth it to be a little careful about drawing too clear a distinction between sanctified leadership inside churches and sin filled leadership uh, in secular corporations. I appreciate that that nuance, John. I'm also sitting on a Herman Miller chair, so I'm really grateful oh. for Max Dupree's leadership <laughs> that you're on too. Yeah. Um, you and I had a really pivotal conversation, helpful for me. I don't know whether you remember it. I remember where I was standing. I remember large pockets of it. But when the news about what was actually happening at Willow broke with Bill mm -hmm. Hybels' abuse of women and, and the abuse of power... And all of that. I just remember being shocked and crushed like so many leaders were. And you and I had a phone call. I was at uh, Terminal 1 at Pearson Airport uh, chatting with you. And I said something like this. And we can cut this out if you're not comfortable talking about it. But I remember saying to you, John, so what do we do with that? I mean, you were there when it was happening. You didn't know. Um, I mean, you and Nancy had a role in, in helping bring the allegations forward, et cetera, et cetera, so that the truth saw the light of day, et cetera. But I'm like... So what do we do with that? Was that just a total waste of time? Was that a smoke screen for something that wasn't real in the first place? Or what was it? And I don't know. Do you remember that conversation? I yeah. remember it very, very yeah. clearly. And yeah. you gave me a super helpful answer. Do you mind just sharing a, a summary of what you said or how you reflect on it now? Because I think that's, there's, 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 Definitely some people from Willow Creek. And by the way, we have an upcoming episode with Tim Stevens mm. where he talks about rebuilding the culture at Willow yeah. Yeah. in the aftermath. But yeah. I mean, there are unfortunately hundreds, 
thousands of churches that have been through a similar trauma Mm -hmm. and people are left going. So was that all a joke? Was that all fake? Was that all evil? Like what, what do we even make of it? Um, What you shared that day was so helpful. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It it was and continues to be a painful journey. And, you know, for both names and me, not just with Willow, Mm -hmm. but um, personally, uh, as things ended at Menlo, these last five years or so have been in- involved the deepest pain uh, in our lives. And I have been grateful, Carrie, for yours and Tony's um, friendship and help as we have navigated all of that. And uh, yeah, I-, I loved those years at Willow Creek. Nancy loved those years at Willow Creek. Uh, and the quick answer is no, it wasn't all in vain. It didn't all mean nothing. Um, Every one of us is a real mixed bag. You know, Solzhenitsyn has that wonderful line where he says, the line between good and evil goes through every human heart. And uh, it's never as simple as us good people over here and those bad people over there. And so uh, there was, has been a great deal of wonderful work, ministry uh, that was done at Willow, continues to be done there. And i love that and rejoice that and celebrate it. Uh, Anytime we hear about somebody who has been guilty of misconduct, particularly if it's the kind of misconduct, which means that a leader needs to be moved out of a leadership position, it can often cause this kind of crisis of faith for people. And among other things, it causes us to remember, um, first of all, that our trust and hope is in God, not in any particular person. And uh, we all are in desperate need of God. There's a wonderful line in AA that talks about, you know, uh, my life each day is contingent on the maintenance of spiritual health and connection with God. That's all. All I get is a daily reprieve from the disease of addiction or just the disease of sin. It's a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my connection with God. So that's true for all of us, true for the leadership that was there. I don't think... Anybody, nobody that I know goes into church work or church pastorate thinking, I'm going to do this so that I can use the church for my own ego gratification, so that I can get more money, so that I can exploit women, so that I can engage in misconduct. I don't think anybody goes into that. But for sure, we all go into it with sin inside of us, Um, sin pathology, as we now call it. Uh, yes. and and need to be working on it. And uh, Dallas would often talk about how uh, there's a very important relationship between gift and character and that it's a great burden if you have more gifts than your character can bear. And uh, the uh, story of Samson in the Bible is maybe the clearest picture of someone who just simply, we all want gifts. We all think it would be great to be more gifted, more talented, smarter, stronger, more attractive. Um, uh, but all of that puts a burden on us that requires a lot of character because it opens up temptation. And so, and, um, uh, so where there is gifting that exceeds character, we all move into a zone of vulnerability. And, um, uh, I think to be able to name that, to expect that sort of thing is going to happen, and then to ask, how do we respond to that in the wisest way? How do we respond to it in a very holistic way? I think part of the challenge that Willow Creek has faced has been um, that there are uh, women who were deeply hurt. And so how do you walk in and, and who remain deeply hurt? How do you walk through a situation like that? Um, uh, with an insistence on truth because there can't be reconciliation unless it's on the basis of truth and learning to distinguish what does grace look like? What does forgiveness look like? What does reconciliation look like? Um, where does truth come into the picture? How do you hold all of the people involved so that you don't collapse any solutions or decision-making into just a restricted group rather than the entire community? And I think that's part of the challenge that Willow has faced and faces and that we all do. Yeah. What I appreciate about your answer and what I appreciate about what you said that day 
John, is that it truly was a mixed bag. Yeah. And I think we live in a culture, particularly a social media and pop culture of dichotomies. You're all good or you're all bad. Right. And there's a tendency to say, well, obviously everything that happened at Willow was bad and, you know, tainted. And I remember saying to you, you know, well, what about all the baptism? And you're like, no, people were actually baptized and they had real, lasting, sustained life change. And God was at work at Willow and there were real problems yeah. and there was systematic abuse and there was abuse of power yeah. and all of that. And I think that's really helpful nuance thinking. And obviously you don't want to, you don't want to sustain or prop up the sinful part or the abuse or the, the systemic uh, challenges in, in any organization or any person. And that had to be dealt with. Um, but you can't just say it was all bad unless it was all bad or I can't say it was all good. And I find that we often run to one of the two poles. Yeah. Either we're not going to talk about the bad, we're just going to focus on the good, or we're only going to talk about the bad and there was no good that happened. And that nuanced response, I thought, was really helpful. Um, great. Any other thoughts on that, John, before we move on? There's so much to talk about. Yeah, I think to recognize that uh, uh, when there is a scandal, that one or whatever one, it doesn't mean that now the person who was involved with that or who was guilty of mis misconduct, if they were, is just all bad. Yeah. Uh, and to recognize that there is good there. And then also to, to uh, well, um, I'll mention this resource, Kerry, for folks who are interested yeah. in this. Um, uh, I met maybe four or five months ago a uh, man who's a research psychologist, emeritus psychologist at University of Virginia Commonwealth, Everett Worthington. And he's kind of the guru of Christians that go into academic psychology and do research. And he's also the guru of forgiveness. Hmm. Uh, he has written uh, dozens of articles on forgiveness. He has written a number of books. One of them, he wrote this book on forgiveness, turned it into the publisher, and two weeks later, a burglar broke into his mother's house and bludgeoned her to death with a crowbar. Oh, oh, that's awful. So Ev had to go from being the research specialist on forgiveness to dealing with my mom was just violated and then murdered about as brutally as it can happen. What do I do with this? And um, I was at a place in life where forgiveness had become a very confusing word for me. And uh, I wasn't sure how to proceed with it. And um, uh, Everett's work on that, anybody who wants to can just Google Everett Worthington. He's got a workbook, one that takes two hours, another one that takes seven hours. I've done them both and spent more hours than that on uh, walking through the process of forgiveness. And um, uh, those are words we can throw around loosely. So, for example... Somebody at a church where a pastor had stepped down, there'd been a scandal and people kind of mixed on how should we respond to that? We're saying, you know, lots of people are saying, isn't it time that we forgive this guy? And my response is, yeah, that would be great. Now let's think about what is forgive. Um, to forgive someone means I agree with you that there was wrong that was done that cannot be excused. Because if I can excuse something, then it doesn't require forgiveness. What requires forgiveness is wrong that is literally inexcusable. And so to forgive a person means to recognize, yep, they have done wrong. I have done wrong. And it can't be excused. And it needs to be forgiven. So I release that person from um, my desire for revenge. And particularly, I seek no longer to ruminate that so that I have negative emotional responses to that person. However, sometimes in churches, isn't the time that we forgive this person um, doesn't mean that at all. It just means let's rehabilitate them. Let's not talk about the bad thing that they did anymore. Let's pretend like it didn't happen. And then, of course, if you have victims of that, you are subjecting them to misconduct or abuse or mistreatment all over again. So understanding um, what is forgiveness, what is rehabilitation, um, uh, what does reconciliation look like? Where does truth come in? How do we relate to folks in all of that? 
Um, those are terribly important subjects. And uh, they're, not, they're not horribly complicated, but they've got layers to them. And if we throw around the language of mercy or grace or truth or justice too loosely, uh, without thinking it through as it relates to each person, we don't help churches. And I think churches have lots of work to do on that. You know, that's a really helpful framing. And I've been thinking a little bit about what forgiveness and repentance actually means mm-hmm. in the context of my own life. And I couldn't help but when you were talking about that, flashing back to my own childhood. And, you know, we grew up in church and I think there was, if you said you're sorry, it's like it never happened, right? That that's basically it. And that hasn't been particularly helpful for me (laughs) growing up. No, ask my wife. It's like, no, just because you're sorry uh, doesn't mean, and I loved your language of what you did is inexcusable. I'm just trying to imagine like growing up in a context where that was, understood that, hey, the way you spoke to your sister or what you did, you know, to your mom, I mean, little things, kid things, what you did was inexcusable. However, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I'm still at 58 coming to terms with things that I've done that truly, you know, the way I treated somebody or what I said, honestly, are inexcusable. And when we sweep it under the carpet, on the other hand, you get on the truth and justice banner and you just banish people to the wilderness where they die of malnutrition and of being cut off from the community. That's not helpful either. So, wow. And I know, I know you've written a book that's going to come out in the future. I've had a chance to read an early copy of it. I can't wait until that comes out there, but we'll save that for another show. John, I want to talk about organizational leadership. And thank you for that. That that was so helpful. Organizational leadership. Yeah and spiritual formation. Yeah. So the two, I agree, they're two camps. And again, thinking about my formation, I think the reason I wasn't very interested in spiritual formation growing up in the church, going to a seminary where there wasn't a lot of growth, there wasn't a lot of growing churches, yeah. people, you know, like I'm, I'm cut like a lawyer, right? So I'm like, got to go win that case. Got to go argue in court. Like, yeah. And I didn't see that in pastors. And I think I kind of, okay, this is really, this is not right, but it's a lie that I think I believed. I saw spiritual formation. Well, you already said it. If you're not a leader, you're a loser. Mm-hmm. I saw it as, oh, if you're with that tribe, you're a failure. Right. So I'm going to be with this tribe. Now, yeah. that was never a conscious thing. Right. I want to pick up at that part of the conversation because number one, I know that's not true, but I think it's a, it's one of those, those lies that maybe needs to be surfaced. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, let's get back into that camp and talk about organizational leadership and spiritual formation because the older I get, the more I want to be spiritually formed and the Mm -hmm. more I need to be spiritually formed but I'm still cut from the leadership cloth. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Talk about yeah. that. Yeah, language is a problem there. You know, when I grew up, churches in my tradition had Christian education departments, not spiritual formation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I remember that. language itself so, is interesting language. It's largely a result of folks like Dallas Willard and Richard Foster and Eugene Peterson. Uh, and the simplest way of thinking about spiritual formation is the analogy, there's an outer you, you have a body. And the outer you is being shaped all the time, whether you want it to or not, uh, what you eat, exercise or don't, sleep, age, gravity, um, it, it's always being shaped. And similarly, there is an inner you. And that's that unceasing flow of thoughts, feelings, choices, desires, perception, greed, fear, anxiety, courage, love. That's going on all the time. And that is also being shaped all the time. It's being formed all the time for better or for worse on purpose or by accident. Um, uh, what I read, what I look at when I'm having a conversation with somebody, um, the thoughts that repeat, it, it mostly operates on habit. Uh, but it's really important for people to understand spiritual formation is not some optional activity for introspective, introverted white males who like to read Henry Nouwen and Thomas Merton. Everybody is receiving a spiritual formation. 
Well, the Teresa had got a spiritual formation. Adolf Hitler got a spiritual formation. When you go to work, you're being spiritually formed. Workplaces now talk a lot about values. What's that about? That's about spiritual formation. They don't use the language of spiritual formation. That's why that's used. What's culture about? That's about spiritual formation. That's, that's why those topics are so huge and, and they matter to us so much. So, um, this is not something that can be avoided, just like leadership is not something that can be avoided. They are both indispensable parts of life. And the question is really, um, uh, will we diligently seek wisdom so that they can be done well? And if you look at the church in its history at its best, um, people have embraced both the gift task of leadership uh, and the indispensable calling to seek to do spiritual formation well. So in the early church, in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2, verse 40, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And they found a way of life through which spiritually formation into Christ's likeness was possible. You know, in Jesus' day, that way was you just literally follow him around. Then he ascends to heaven, so they got to find a new way. So now that's exactly the way that's described in that church. It was very clear you're pursuing it or you're not. It got watered down over time so that by the time of Constantine, half the Roman Empire is now Christian, but mostly that's just affirming certain beliefs. So then you have Anthony going out into the desert and saying, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a way with more power for transformation in it. And then you get what's called the rule of life and the monastic traditions. And all through the centuries, there'll be these moments when somebody says, there's got to be another way. So Bonhoeffer, Life Together, The Twelve Steps with AA, those are all people finding actionable ways of life. And that's a huge need in our day. There is no reason why that cannot be wed with uh, a deep commitment and a deep appreciation for the task of organizational leadership. And if you look in church history at people like Benedict or... uh Ignatius, the spiritual exercises, or John Wesley, you will see people who had unbelievable leadership gifts, uh, who had a genius for figuring out how do we organize? How do I recognize talent? How do I find people that are really gifted? How do I make sure I get them in the right place? How do I correct things if they start getting off track? How do I leverage resources really well? How, you know, Wesley's making sure that the poor are going to be taken care of and who have great wisdom around what's a way of life? How do I practice solitude? How do I pray? You know, Ignatius wanted to send people all around the world. So the old Benedictine system of stopping for prayer seven hours a day was never going to work given his mission. And he would actually get people into trouble if they prayed too long. Um, because he was, so he invents the spiritual exercises as another way that formation can happen that can enable the mission that he feels called to. So all of which is to say, if people look back at church history, when the church has been at its best consistently, there have been great leaders who practiced the craft of organizational leadership diligently, and there has been great wisdom about spiritual formation, and people find a concrete, actionable way of life through which it can happen. Mm. All right. So point us maybe, because there are two tribes listening. Yeah. There's the people who are like, yep, I'm organizational leadership, but there's also spiritual formation people. Yeah. And I agree that the fusion of the two is really important. And yeah. I think that leads to uh, longevity in ministry because you don't want your platform to get bigger than your character. You don't want your leadership to outpace your character because that's an implosion or at least you know, an implosion that should happen. Um, You shouldn't have that in leadership. On the other hand, there are people who are probably beautifully spiritually formed who could be leading more. And I say, you know, the other thing that that is really interesting, and I think the historic examples you raise are great uh, examples, but it was Gordon MacDonald on this podcast who told us that one of the big challenges, and it's so easy to forget it, is big churches are a very recent phenomenon. Yeah. Right? Like, mm-hmm. if you had a church of a thousand people in the 70s, there were maybe five of them if you weren't Roman Catholic doing Mass. Right. But if you were Protestant, we just didn't have big churches. 
And then all of a sudden the mega church movement takes off in the 80s and 90s, the multi-site, then you know, now there's thousands of leaders leading churches well above a thousand in people. And that is a different skill set mm-hmm. than 150 people who are your quote flock, yeah. right? So knowing that there are a lot of leaders there and we've got to fuse these gifts, let's start with the people in the spiritual formation camp. What what are a couple of things they could do in an integrated way to become better at developing competencies or skill sets in the area of organizational leadership. That's wonderful. And I think it starts with um, recognizing organizational leadership, whatever the right word for it is that you will come up with, uh, as a God-given legitimate craft that requires celebration and development. Mm. So uh, I, I think of an academician I know who is just sour on leadership because there can be many problems associated with it, you know, as we've discussed. But he basically uh, said we shouldn't use the word and we shouldn't practice it. So one of his examples was when there's a committee meeting, we should just rotate whoever's leading that committee. And this is a brilliant guy, way smarter than me, but that's one of the dumbest ideas I ever heard. (laughs) And we all know what it's like when you have a team meeting and there's somebody who is observant, they're able to see who's on board. They can tell when somebody starts drifting. If somebody's talking too much, they will intervene. If somebody is being silent, they will draw them out. Um, if the topic isn't moving in the right direction, they will shift topics. Like when you're, it's like, uh, you know, the ability to steer a boat or something. When you're in a meeting that's being led by somebody who has those gifts versus somebody who is just tone deaf and colorblind, it is night and day. So that's that's a bright person, academically, theologically, spiritually well-tuned, but they are blind to an essential part of humanity um, that they need to see. Uh, somebody else, I never talked with him about this. I have learned enormous amounts. Again, somebody way smarter and better than me, Eugene Peterson, um, wrote wonderfully about spiritual formation, and he wrote prophetically critiquing pastors that are just into success and allowing the secularization of pastor ministry. But honestly, I don't remember ever reading Eugene talking about the craft of leadership as a legitimate craft. And so I would have loved for Eugene to write, for example, about how do you structure a church around spiritual gifts so that it's led by leaders and taught by people with the spiritual gift of teachers and administrated by people with the spiritual gift of administration. When I was at Willow, I loved the clarity around that notion that the church ought to be organized around spiritual gifts. And ironically, in the mainline church, you know, you, you get people hired as pastors. And even though they're theologically very astute, uh, nobody's thinking about how is this person wired up? How are they gifted? And are we making sure that they're operating in their area of giftedness? So uh, if you're a person where you're into spiritual formation and you're at a church or in pastor ministry, just asking, where am I gifted by God? How am I wired? And how do I make sure that's primarily where I'm involved? And then when I'm not gifted, how do I, we make sure that we get other people involved there? And to have somebody who's in the organizational leadership position of the gift, who's got the gift of organizational leadership, that's just huge. I can remember Eugene's got this wonderful book, Working the Angles. Hmm. And uh, I have profited enormously from that book. He begins, again, with this very prophetic, kind of curmudgeonly tone, which he was pretty good at, where he talks about, you know, churches are turning into a culture of shopkeepers. And I remember thinking when I read that, you know, in the Bible, obviously, shepherd was a primary image occupation that was used to describe pastors because lots of people were shepherds. Mm -hmm. You know, shopkeeping is as legitimate an occupation in the eyes of God as shepherding or carpentry was. There is no reason why Jesus could not have been or be a shopkeeper. So I'd have loved to Mm. give Eugene the assignment to say, okay, now what does it look like for a really effective, uh, high initiative, high energy shopkeeper to go to town? And what can pastors learn from that? 
So for people on the spiritual formation side to get to crystal clarity about what is the gifting and craft of organizational leadership? What are the activities that it involves? How do you diagnose if somebody has it or not? How do I diagnose that in myself? And then how do I help to make sure that in our church, we define clearly where um, the gift of organizational leadership is going to be required and how do we unleash it there? I'll tell you a book that would be great for all the folks that are more on the spiritual formation side to read. Um, it's called uh, A Failure of, Ner- of Nerve. Oh, yeah. Is that Edwin Friedman? Yeah, Edwin Friedman. Yeah. And he talks about how there are a lot of cultures that sabotage leadership. And it's not mostly that we're not smart enough. And a lot of times folks who are on the spiritual formation side are pretty smart. They like books and they can take a lot of pride being smart. But he says the problem very often is a failure of nerve. It's a lack of courage. And we actually create systems that sabotage leadership. He's got a really interesting observation in that book where uh, denominational leaders come to him and they've got, I think it's $5 million that uh, they can invest in helping to rehab burnt out leaders. And Edwards, because he's kind of brilliant on this stuff, he says, well, that's not going to accomplish a whole lot. If you really want to achieve mission, you should invest that $5 million into identifying and equipping highly gifted leaders. And their response is, mm-hmm. oh, nobody would give to that. <laughs> so we'll get they're to the, living the, now the cure, in a culture the- that no longer recognizes and celebrates the legitimate craft of leadership and how important it is for the church. You know, I kind of wish Eugene had written in the vein you were talking about as well. I always feel rebuked when I read him, Mm -hmm. and yet I can't put him down. He's just so compelling. And you're right. And I mean, his church never really got above three or 400 in size, too. I think largely because he saw that as a burden, if I'm reading him correctly. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm just going to pastor these people, do the best I can, which was his calling. All right, let's take it from the other angle. Let's take it from the angle of those of us in the organizational leader camp. Mm-hmm. What can we do beyond reading your Bible and praying uh, to develop our spiritual formation? Yeah. Uh, and I, I think probably where that one begins would be the mirror image of um, folks on the spiritual formation side recognizing there is this discipline, there is this craft that is to be honored and studied and applauded. Um, uh, for people that have strong leadership gifts, especially this is where Jesus' warnings come in, just to start with me. Um, how is my character doing? How is my soul doing? Dallas Willard would often say, the main thing God gets out of your life is the person you become. And it's very easy for people who are wired up on the leadership side to disbelieve that. Or discount it because it's going so well at work. You have no idea. The main thing that God gets out of my life are the hills that I have taken. The main thing God will get out of my life Mm -hmm. is the organization that I have built, is the ministry that I have achieved. No. What you will take into eternity is the person that you have become. And so to make sure that you understand that and that you actually own that and then ask that question, well, um, then how do I begin to become that kind of person? Hmm. Um, so it's, it's, it's tempting to think that I can outsource and offload this. There'll just be a good program of spiritual formation out there someplace. So I just have to find spiritual formation in a box and then hand that off to somebody on staff. And then everybody in the church will be spiritually formed. And I remember asking Dallas one time, how do I, help people in my church get better spiritually formed. And there was a long pause as there always was with Dallas. And then his response was, you must arrange your life so that you are experiencing deep joy, contentment, and confidence in your everyday life with God. And I said, no, 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 no. I didn't ask about me. (laughs) I asked about them. They're the ones that need it. And he said, Um, I know what you asked. 
But the reality is that you will always reproduce the person that you are. And if there is a gap between what it is that you say and how it is that you live, the people closest to you, the people on your team will know what you really believe is reflected in the way that you live. And so that's the way that they will live. And then that will trickle out to their people. You will always reproduce the person that you become. And so if you're really serious about uh, building a community of transformed people, there is simply no way to outsource that in your own life. And the temptation, I think, for leaders is always to think, oh, well, uh, I will experience that deep joy, confident, contentment in my everyday life when all the charts are up and to the right and everything's going well yes. and I finally achieved it. <laughs> and so that, that it's a very challenging statement. And of course, if you don't do this, what will happen is um, uh, uh, over time, more and more and more, and we've all seen this, the ministry will really be about my ego and my success. And then the people around me will have this sense, really, they are just very capable helpers, little cogs in my machine. And uh, what's really driving it is me. And I'll talk with so many people who do work at large churches where if things get off track, there's just this sense of, I kind of feel like I'm being used. And there's a kind of cynicism that grows. Um, but we're not allowed to talk about it. And it's covered over with this thin veneer of spiritual language. And it's so tempting to do that with the church because, of course, we're preaching the gospel and we're winning disciples to Jesus. So how can anybody complain about that? But so that word, um, you must do this. Now, your elders will not do this. Your staff will not do this. Your spouse will not do this. You must arrange your life so that you are experiencing deep contentment, joy, confidence in your everyday life with God. You cannot wait on this. You can't put it off another week. You can't wait until you hire this person. You can't wait until you grow this much. You can't wait until you get this much money. You must do this, and you must do this now, and you must do this every day. Hmm. I'm hanging on every word, John. Uh, I do not want to deputize you, but perhaps you should write that book on the fusion of leadership and spiritual formation. That, that would be extremely helpful from one who is drunk from both wells. Um, wow, John, I, I think this is a beautiful place to end. I know we're going to have more conversations, God willing, um, but I don't want to pollute it with more. That was a beautiful place. But I would like to give you the final word. Uh, no irony, if you've listened to the whole conversation, which at this point you have, that, John, your new ministry is called Become New. Of course. Of course it is, right? You're on YouTube. You have a website. Uh, tell us where people can connect with you. And I hope they do online these days. Yeah, it's a uh, daily online kind of spiritual teaching ministry, most Monday through Fridays. Uh, and they can just look at become new or become new.com. And um, that's where you'll find me. Awesome. John, thank you. Thanks, Carrie. It's a joy.